Word of God, we're coming to part seven of our series on the battle for the mind. And I really do believe it's timely what we're dealing with. This is volume two of our series. We will have a volume three and we'll go back to certainly dealing with things more practically. But here in this series, I believe it's timely for what is happening in our world, in politics and in society. In fact, I believe we need to be warned and prepared. Some preachers do not like to warn the church, lest it seems like scaremongering. I want to tell you that Jesus in Matthew 24 warned the church about the hour we are living in now. Three times before he dealt with anything else about earthquakes or pestilence, three times he warned the church, beware of men, beware of false prophets, lest any man deceive you. Three times he warned of deception. You see, I believe we serve a Christ that does warn. It's not scaremongering. It's not to create fear or concern. It's actually to prepare you. It would be a terrible thing if you as a church were not prepared for what's around the corner. Do you know, we live in an hour, and I wish we didn't, where you need to warn your children about who they go with, about getting in cars, about who comes and speaks to them. We actually have to warn them. I wish we didn't have to, that it was such an hour that we can trust everyone. But you know what? There are certain times you've got to warn your children. It's not every generation it's like that, but there are certain generations where wickedness abounds. You better prepare that child early. You don't need to tell them everything but you need to give simple, clear warnings. It's not making that child scared or insecure. It's not doing that. It's protecting that child. And it's the same with us with the Bible. When the Bible warns, we warn, we have to warn. This generation that you and I have entered into has more said to it than any other church generation in 1900 years. All of the scripture, is for all of the church in every generation. That's true. But I believe there's more specific, detailed, applicable prophecies, descriptions, and warnings for you than the church for the past 1900 years. That ought to get our attention. And you know what that tells me? God wants to warn you. Such events are gonna happen in our generation. You must be aware and have your eyes open and your ears open. We're coming to set part seven of this series on the battle for the mind. And I believe that we are about to, we the church of this hour, are about to engage in the greatest assault of the mind that you could possibly imagine. And I believe these messages prepare you so that you won't be ignorant or shocked at the mental battle that comes against you because it is coming. You haven't seen anything yet. My message, part seven here, my message tonight, I've simply called brainwashed, brainwashed. Reading from 2 Kings chapter 18, verse one to verse eight tonight. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse one to verse eight. As we deal with brainwashed, and I've, I'm going to make a double play on this title here tonight, which I'll explain shortly. But reading from 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse, chapter 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was also Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, and he broke the images and cut down the groves, and he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan, 
In other words, just a piece of brass. Do you notice that's what he calls it? It's just a bit of brass. Why are you offering incense to this thing? It's idolatry. Then it says in verse 5, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he cleaved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and he served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchmen to the fence city. Will you pray with me as we deal with brainwashed here tonight in this battle for the mind? Saints, you need to be aware that an intensive part of the battle that the church is going to face for its mind is going to be this thing called brainwashing. Father, I do pray tonight as we come to your word, will you speak us, will you, will you prepare us, will you make us ready, O oh God, to stand like Hezekiah did in his day. What an example that there was no king before him or after him that clung to you, that trusted you, that prospered in obeying your word, in meditating in the word of God, in removing idolatry and all manners of traditions of men from the people of God. Father, what a remarkable man that brought revival. Revival burnt in Jerusalem, then in Judah, then in the surrounding regions. Father, thank you, Lord God, that you can suddenly, dramatically raise up men and women to see revival again. Lord God, I pray as this man Hezekiah made a stand against brainwashing and preserved the city of God and the people of God from every brain brainwashing of politics, of military strategy, Lord God, of social agreement. I pray that you would give us the same victory in simple faith in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, I, I know with a title like this, Brainwashed, it seems strange to be reading the text that I have just read tonight, but you're going to fully understand why I read this text here tonight, because I believe Hezekiah has everything to do with what you need to hear tonight. My message, brainwashed. As I said, no generation is going to be faced with being brainwashed like this generation of the 21st century. You see, the Bible speaks very clearly about the generation you're in. It gives us details precisely, politically, socially, nationally, in every area of society of what is just about to happen in our world. In this generation of almost 8 billion people, God gives accurate information. And I believe one of the great things that's going to come to our world is this thing called brainwashing. It's going to come as an act of hell, an act of Satan, and it's going to saturate the nations of the world. Listen with me for a moment. It says in Revelation 12 and 9, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent who was in the Garden of Eden called the devil and Satan and listen this, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth and angels were cast out with him. It says in Revelation 13 and 11, and behold, another beast, we dealt with it last week, another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. Revelation 18, 23, it says, Thy merchants, speaking about Babylon, that city that's going to arise in these last days. Thy merchants or thy tradesmen are the great businessmen of the world, the great men of the earth. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. 
Then Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, that is the Antichrist, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake burning with fire and brimstone. Since I believe the Bible warns us of a common hour where all nations are going to be deceived. The Bible is very clear. This generation, and I believe this is the time, we are preparing. The stage is being set for all nations to be deceived. There are coming great leaders. A great prophet is going to arise doing miracles, doing signs and wonders, and he is going to speak like a dragon. We're told that this prophet and this political leader who arises in the last days, they are going to use pharmacia. It says in chapter 18 that through thy sorceries, the word there is pharmacia, or the use of drugs. And it's not talking about drugs. It's talking about a government system coming that's going to use drugs or pharmacia. And it's going to use this thing called sorcery or pharmacia to deceive all nations. There's going to be a bid for the mind of this generation using pharmaceutical drugs. Since I'm telling you what is going to come, there is a ploy and a plan by very powerful persons to use drugs to deceive an entire generation. But not only that, they're going to use technology to tie you into an economic system. And not only that, this prophet is going to have a voice, a message. He's going to speak. There is going to be a worldwide message to deceive an entire generation. That's why here I am speaking on being brainwashed brainwashed. It's a very, very real thing. What does it mean to be brainwashed? It means to affect a person's mind by using extreme mental pressure or any other mind affecting process. Doesn't matter whether it's drugs or technology or a politician standing proclaiming his message. This is also known as mind control, menticide, thought reform, or a nice way to coin it is re-education of the population. It is the concept that the human mind can be altered and controlled by certain psychological techniques. Brainwashing is said to reduce its subjects or its victims ability. They lose the ability to critically think or to think independently. In other words, they fall into line or to allow the introduction of new unwanted thoughts and ideas into their minds. No, notice that brainwashing moves you reluctantly. It doesn't tell you what it's doing. It's not presenting an idea and saying, why don't you believe this or you should believe this? No, no. What it is doing is subtly in deception is to change your thinking over basic things. You do it reluctantly and yet you can be deceived in having your whole idea within a period of time changed to allow new ideas, new agendas to come into your mind, as well as to change your attitudes, your values, your beliefs, your convictions. All of this is the work of brainwashing. You see, another word we know is propaganda. And real propaganda has one object, to brainwash an individual. Brainwashing is also called coercive persuasion. It's an individualistic system or effort to persuade you or a mass population to accept a certain allegiance, a certain command, or a certain doctrine. It is more generally applied to any technique designed to manipulate the human thought or the actions of individuals, listen this carefully, against their desire, against their will, 
against their personally held knowledge of the individual by controlling the physical environment around them. It is an attempt to destroy loyalties that you hold within your heart and your mind and to move you in an utterly different direction than what you would normally desire to hold. It is the individual that has attitudes and patterns of thinking are being changed to align with a political ideology or something else. This could happen in a political realm or a religious realm or even a cult. That's why we stand for the liberty of conscience. We believe in a man's right to go to hell as much as to go to heaven. We believe in the rights of a man to reject the gospel on the basis of knowledge. We don't trick men or women into the gospel. We tell them the full consequence. It will cost you to follow Jesus. It will cost you to turn your back on this world. You see, we don't trick people in with the gospel. We openly hold out the Bible and say you can test our words. Everything we say is in the open. You can weigh it. You can make your own decision. And when you make it, you will sleep in your own bed. You see, that's why the gospel is not brainwashing in that tech in, in that sort of style. It's not in deception. It's not trying to coerce people into opinion against their will. If you don't want to believe this, I'd hate for you to believe it. If you didn't desire to be in the house of God, I'd hate for you to be here. I really would. But we're talking about brainwashing. That's my message, part seven, the attack on the mind, brainwashed. But let me, just before I go to this, is just to tell you two different sides of this I'm going to deal with tonight. One side is the side that I've just mentioned, brainwashing. Brainwashing in society and in history, and I'm going to give you examples. But there's another realm, and I want to play on the word here, brainwashed. I believe all of you are going to be brainwashed one way or the other. Every person in this room, you're going to be brainwashed. Either you're going to be brainwashed, moved by deception into something that you would not want to believe, or your brain is going to be washed by the water of the Word of God. I'm using that in two different ways. Since we need as Christians our brain to be washed, washed by the Word of God, washed by the truth of God. And I believe we're at an hour. Either the devil is going to deceive you and brainwash you, or the Lord Jesus Christ is going to wash your brain. He's going to renew it, rewire it, fix it up again, and to clean out all the filth and the pollution. Since you are going to have one of these two things, you're either going to be brainwashed by an antichrist spirit that's in the world right now, or you're going to be brainwashed graciously by the Lord Jesus Christ in a remarkable, a remarkable way. Brother Paul preached a message in August 2019 called the propaganda of Satan. It would do you well to listen to it again. How Satan uses his propaganda against the mind. Do you know what propaganda is used to do? It's used in advertising. It sends you information and it's usually biased in its nature. It leaves out realms of truth. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible gives you everything. What what uh, brainwashing and propaganda does is it stops the voice of discontent or of being challenged. It wants to silence every other voice and it wants to proclaim its own message. It, it wants to be absolutely in control. It wants to dominate or to flood the scene with its own voice. I believe we've got many examples from the 20th century. I believe Lenin, who led the Russian Revolution, was such a man who understood what I am saying. Listen to what he said. Give me four years to teach the children, and the seed that I have sown will never be uprooted. You know as well, Candace used to teach music, and she told me, she said, Lenin said, give me the music of a people and I will have that people. You see, these men like Lenin, 
These men like Stalin and Hitler and many others like Mussolini, and we could keep on listing them. They understood you've got to have the mind of the people. You've got to capture the mind of the people. If you're going to have power in the nation, if you're going to exert military and political power, you must have that mind. Never will a world's population have their mind grabbed for like this generation that we are living in. It's a very serious hour. And so you need to know how to stand against being brainwashed. You need to know the cure for it. You know how you need to know how to have a mind washed by the word of God, whereby you are not brainwashed by this world system. Let me give you an example and a foretaste of what I believe is coming and it's already here in this hour and will intensify in the days ahead. We know how Hitler arose. He was a painter from the back streets of Austria. He was a nobody. He used to carry bags at the train station. Nobody could have looked at him and imagined the man that would rise up to dominate an entire generation. At his right hand was another man called Joseph Goebbels. He was the prophet of the Nazi regime. And I believe Goebbels gives us an insight into brainwashing, into a political system that is trying to silence every other voice and to lead us in a certain direction. Joseph Goebbels from 1933 stood as the right hand man of Hitler. He was Hitler's prophet. And he was the main man who took a hold of the radio in that nation. He would buy you a radio in order to get his message to you. He says, we'll buy you all radios and you can listen to me at night. The message that I'm going to pump out. What did he preach? Utter loyalty to the state. Utter loyalty to Hitler. And utter loyalty to an ideology. Listen to a few quotes from him. If you have nothing to hide... You have nothing to fear. He is playing on the emotions of people. He said, give me the media within Germany and I have the people. If I control the media, I'll have that entire generation. Do you understand what's happening in this day and hour? Every voice is being stopped in our nation. They're doing it on YouTube. Facebook, they're doing it on news media, they're doing it on television, they're doing it with newspapers. We are not living at a normal hour. This wasn't happening like it is now two years ago. Something is happening in our world. It is spiritual. There is a power and it's for a purpose. And you know what? All the nations of the world, the same thing is happening. A silence of every other voice and only one message coming through. Through doesn't matter the nation or the political party. It doesn't matter the newspaper, the history. You've got the same message, the same voice coming through. How could that possibly happen? But it is happening right now in our generation. Goebbels also said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it and you will believe it yourself. He said propaganda works best when those being manipulated are sure that they are acting out of their own free will. This is the secret of propaganda. Those who need to be persuaded must be immersed in the ideas being propagated without realizing that they are being immersed in it. He also said, a lie you tell once remains a lie, but a lie you tell a thousand times becomes the truth. You see, that's why Goebbels knew, I've got to control that voice that speaks to every person within the nation. I've got to be in the radio. I've got to be in the biggest pulpits. I've got to be in the newspaper. We've got to get the young. We've got to have the Hitler youth. We've got to infiltrate the schools. We've got to get inside the churches. They radically changed the German nation within a period of a decade. They radically changed an entire generation. I lived in Germany for three years and I often said, how could the people of Germany have been deceived by this. They're an intellectual people. They're an academic people. They're a free thinking people. And yet an entire generation pulled behind a man called Hitler that 
pulled our entire world into great tragedy. He goes on to say further, think of the media as a grand piano for governments to play upon. This is how they done it. Change the mind. Since change the mind of an entire generation, propaganda, brainwashing an entire generation, and their main focus was that young generation. Give us that young generation and we'll change the entire nation. It is the absolute right of the state to determine and shape public opinion. The essence of propaganda is to win people over to an idea with their whole being so that they eventually sink into it completely and can never escape from it. Whoever is able to conquer the street or the masses that walk on the street will one day conquer the state because every form of power politically and every state controlled by a dictatorship has its roots in a popular movement amongst the masses. What am I telling you tonight? You live in a unique hour, and I've watched this for years, the UN, the ideology in the early 90s, I'm reading about what they planned for the young people of every generation. They were bringing out a worldwide education system, political system, social system, legal system. They've been planning this openly since the early 90s. You know what? It's here now. This is the hour, the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the UN, all these institutions, and now our governments in this hour are all falling into step with this. Since we have just watched the beginning of the biggest fascist takeover of world governments, we have literally watched it. No shot was fired. No army was in the field. Do you know how they done it? Through what I'm saying, propaganda, the media, the, the emails, the internet, all the technology. Give me the internet. Give me YouTube. Give me Facebook. Give me the BBC News every night and I'll have that generation. Do you hear me that if the people don't understand what happened with Lenin and the Russian Revolution, if they don't understand what happened with Stalin and with Hitler and with Napoleon and all through the ages, if they don't understand that entire societies can change overnight, when you get the right people who know what they're doing according to this and the devil inspires them, you can have a worldwide revolution. Do you know what they're making a bid for now? A worldwide revolution. Now that I've got your attention, I want to preach from the Word of God here tonight. My message brainwashed, but I'm showing you two different types of brainwashing. The devil's brainwashing. I believe Hezekiah, who I want to bring you to tonight, was a man who stood against one of the most unbelievable hours of brainwashing that ever come against God's people. And I believe he stood resolute. You ought to ask why. And God's people, God's remnant stood and came through that hour. It was unbelievable. We read about this in 2 Kings chapter 18. Read with me here for a moment. As we look at this man, Hezekiah, the type of man he was. It says here in verse 3, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. His heart was right. He did what was right because his heart was right. He obeyed God. It says in verse 4, he removed the high places, all the false ideologies, the compromise, the compromise of the altar of God, a worship of the word of God of the order in society. Do you know what he done? He's a man of 25 years old. And you know what? His father was one of the most wicked kings in Judah, in its history. He was a vile man. His father had destroyed the temple, the house of God, had brought in apostasy and a false altar to worship at. In other words, Hezekiah, growing up as a young boy and then a teenager, watched an utter destruction of God's house until the doors were shut on it. 
Can you imagine that? But this young boy, Hezekiah, you know what? Somebody got to him. And you know who that somebody was? He was a man called Isaiah the prophet. You see, that young boy had a wicked home, a wicked family, and had to sit in wicked services with wicked priests and wicked prophets. But there was a prophet in the nation called Isaiah, an old man of God who lived a ministry through the reigns of four kings in Israel. And yet here is a young boy who begins to hear the word of God. We don't know who we're affecting in this hour. I'm talking about a different type of brainwashing. Hezekiah's father had destroyed the nation with a form of religious brainwashing. Every other voice was silenced. And this false ideology was brought in. But you know, this young boy heard the preaching of a real prophet and man of God. And you know what it made him do? To seek after the Lord. The Bible says there was no king before him or after him like him. You can only liken him to King David. That's the closest. But nobody was as remarkable as him. 25 years old, he's only in the door. And within seven days, he clears out Jerusalem. I mean, he turns a city around within one week. Within 21 days, revival is spreading out through the nation. He gets rid of the false worship. He pulls down idolatry. He begins to put God's people back in order. He restores holiness, the preaching of the word. He restores everything saints of God. What a remarkable man of God. It says in verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him. He trusted, he had faith in the Lord God. In verse 6 it says, he clave to the Lord God. Not only did he trust, but he clave and he departed not from following him and he kept his commandments. And the Lord was with him and he prospered him. You know what the Bible says? A man in the house of God prospers when he meditates upon the word of God. Do you want to prosper? You're going to meditate. That mind is going to be washed. Your brain is going to be washed. I'd like to hold up to you King Hezekiah, the young king that was brainwashed. Not brainwashed like Lenin did it, but he was a young man that had his mind washed clean. He had a pure motive. He had a pure desire. He had a pure vision of the Lord and he cleaved to the Lord or he stuck to the Lord. Here tonight, you are going to have to make a choice in this iron generation. Do you know what? King Hezekiah was being prepared of God for an hour when the greatest political, religious, social, military system was going to invade the land and desire to conquer Jerusalem and to finally stamp out any opposition of the people of God. We are there now. That's where we are right now. And I believe God prepared Hezekiah and he was going to be able to stand in that hour. When we come to Second Kings, and chapter 18, read with me verse 17. And we read, And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshaketh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool which is in the highway of the fuller's field. Since this was an hour that the Assyrian army invaded the little nation of Judah. You see, I believe a great massive invasion has taken place in our world in every area. And there is an agenda in the UN, the World Economic Forum, and in the system of education to stamp out morality to remove the laws of God, to remove the influence of biblical preachers. I believe that with all my heart in this hour. And I believe it's exactly like Hezekiah's day when you've got this massive great army invading the land led by Rab Rabshaketh. He invaded leading this army and it says it was a great host against Jerusalem. In other words, they were weighed down 
military force and power. And when they had called to the king, there came out to, to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Aspha, the recorder. Notice here, Hezekiah sends out his three key men. One of them is a scribe, a writer of the word of God, a scholar of the word of God. He sends three men out to meet these three great generals of the Syrian army and to talk together. I believe here, and I'm going to give you it right now, this king or this general that was sent against Jerusalem was going to bring three lies to try and deceive, to try and brainwash the people of God in Jerusalem. This great general, this leader, Rabshaketh, came not with an army. He doesn't fire any shot. No battle takes place. Do you know what he's coming to do? He is going to defeat Jerusalem by words, arguments, by threats, by pleas, by persuasion. In other words, he uses propaganda. That's what we see in this entire chapter. And Hezekiah is there having to stand against it. This is an onslaught of unbelievable arguments, ridicule, pointing out weaknesses, offering you presents, doing everything. You know what? To conjole you to submit unwillingly because you've got a lot of doubts, a lot of fears, but he's using arguments to make you fall in line with this political, social, military system. And he doesn't want to fire one arrow across the walls of Jerusalem. I want to give you three main lies that this great general speaks against the people of God because I believe we're going to face it. Everything is going to come against the people of God in this hour. The first one is that he denies that he denies God's faithfulness. That's the first lie. Rabshaketh, when he comes against them, he denies God's faithfulness. Look at verse 19. And Rabshaketh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? You're going to find in this first argument, propaganda or brainwashing. Remember, this great general is a wordsmith. He is a brilliant man like Goebbels. I mean, he's a mastermind of words and elocution and of the psychology of individual minds. He knows how to speak to men. He can make you drop your gates to leave the walls of defense all by arguments, by verbal arguments. Isn't this what we find from the Garden of Eden, how the devil <clears throat> works down through? And notice here, his first attack is on their confidence or their trust in the Lord. He actually begins to deny that God is going to be faithful to them. He's after their faith in God. You know what? You're going to get attacked in this hour and it's going to intensify. I promise you it's going to get very, very strong. There's going to come a challenge that God is not faithful, that your faith is misplaced, that your confidence in the Bible has been misplaced. I believe we're standing in an hour where the enemy in our world society from the UN down to local schools is going to attack the word of God like never before in all of world history. Do you know the Bible is the most attacked book in all of history? Do you realize it was the most burnt book, the most challenged book, and yet it still marches on? No other book has been attacked like the Bible, and yet it doesn't even have a scratch upon it. The Word of God is still as mighty and powerful. They haven't found one contradiction in the Word of God. This great general, when he come up, begins to challenge their confidence and their trust. What is this confidence that you have in this old book? What is this faith that you have in this old-fashioned Middle Eastern religion? What is it? He begins to challenge. He then says, thou sayest, and they're only vain words that you're saying, but thou sayest, I have taken counsel, and we are strengthened for war. 
What does he say to them? Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Do you realize there, there's coming an hour where there's going to be a mighty rebellion against the ideology of this hour? Do you realize if you don't bow and submit to this, there's going to be a mighty rebellion that's going to spread across the face of the earth. Individuals are going to come out of every area of society in this hour and stand up and rebel against an ideology that's being forced on them. You will believe in evolution. You will believe in our ideology. You will submit to our commands and dictates. You know what? We're going to see a rebellion from ocean to ocean in this hour. When the devil comes, he begins to challenge this trust, this faith, this rebellion. You know all you are is an old rebel or a young rebel, that's all you are. Why don't you believe like everyone else? Why can't you just sit quietly? Keep your religion, have your faith, have your confidence, but just fit in with everyone else. Why, why do you have to be different? Why do you have to think different and believe different? You know why? Because what you're doing is a lie. It is deception and it's undermining the confidence in the word of God. He goes further and he says here, as he challenges their faith, you see, he's saying, you're a rebel. No, I believe in the authority of the Bible. I believe in free speech. I believe in free thought. I believe a man can challenge the Bible and question the Bible and question the preacher, but they're taking away our rights. You're not allowed to challenge the medical system or the politicians or the prime minister or anyone else. Saints, I'm telling you, something's changed in our world where you're not allowed to be a rebel in this hour. You see, all the young guys, Sophan and Rory have said this, all the guys with their strange haircuts and all their tattoos and all their earrings, you know what? They're all falling in step with this. You know who the nonconformists in this hour are? People like you and I who know what the Bible says. We have a confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a born rebel, but I tell you what, try to challenge my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to find I'm a mighty rebel against all of these ideologies in this hour. This great general, when he came against Hezekiah and the people, he's challenging their faith, calling them rebels. We're not rebels. We're the best citizens Limerick's ever had. I, I, I tell you, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm a good citizen. I'm trying to clean up this city. I'm trying to see drug addicts saved and turning away from sin. I'm not a rebel. But when an ideology comes in that makes people like you and I a criminal, the whole thing's rotten top to bottom. Whenever uh, those that break laws and do evil are let off in our courts, and yet the innocent ones start fearing for their freedom. Something very evil has got into that legal system. Rabshakeh goes on further in verse 21. He says, Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of the bruised reed, even Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. Do you know in Israel, in Jerusalem of that hour, there were some, there were voices, there were people, there were families who in that hour, they start saying, why don't we go to Egypt for help? You know, Egypt's got a good army. It's very structured. It's fought many battles. Why don't we go to the world? Egypt always represents the strength of this world, the power of man's hand and might. You know, there's many in the church of this hour, they're looking to worldly ways to deal with this. Why don't we demonstrate? Why don't we do, sign petitions? Why don't we do all these things? That's very well. But I assure you, listen to what Rab Shekhar says here. None of that's going to save you bunch. You don't realize what you're dealing with here. This is a spiritual power. It's a spiritual battle. You think demonstrating on the high street's gonna stop this. Oh no, that isn't the answer. You know, it's fine if you wanna demonstrate. If you wanna stand outside the abortion clinic, praise God, you go do that if that's your burden. But you won't find me demonstrating on the high street. I'm gonna preach the word of God here because you know what? Any young girl that comes in here and gets born again, she will never get an abortion. I tell you, I, I'm going to make sure that her brain is so washed with the word of God that such would be an absolute abomination to even think of such. 
Here you have is that some in Jerusalem were looking towards Egypt. But he says, but if we say, if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God. He says, no, I'm not talking to those compromisers who are looking at this world. I'm talking to you bunch who say, we're trusting to the Lord. Why don't you let me in? Why don't you surrender? Why don't you submit to Assyria? Why don't you come under this ideology? I know why it is. You're going to tell me you trust in the Lord. You believe the Bible. You're one of those old fashioned Christians who say you can't say that homosexuality is okay. And you don't believe that all religions lead to, to heaven. I, I understand that. But he says, look what he says here to them. We trust in the Lord our God. Is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away? You know what he's saying here? You're a radical bunch, you are. I, I know who you are. You see, I represent a very broad realm of ecumenical Christianity and religion. We believe in the goodness of all men. You see, you don't believe that. You believe men's hearts are depraved. You've gone and torn down every altar that doesn't look like your altar. Hezekiah was a very focused man. He come back to one altar. It was the old brazen altar where blood was shed for sin. That's all he had, saints of God. Now Rabshakeh comes in and he begins to mock that. He says, don't think you can trust in the Lord. Do you know what? You, Hezekiah, who you're listening to, has told these things, made the way very, very narrow and said that men can only be born again and saved by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. I mean, that's narrow. That's as narrow as you get. What about this broad way of the World Economic Forum or the United Nations? We believe in letting everybody in. We love everyone. We accept everyone. We've got a place for everyone. Apart from Hezekiah, you don't have a place for him yeah. at the table, I can assure you. He says, now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, <coughs> the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses. I'll give you some gifts. Why don't you just submit and I'll give you all the blessings. I'll give you whatever you need, a horse. A car, what do you want? A house, a good job? I'll give it all to you. Why don't you submit and I'll give all of this to you? This is the first great attack that Assyria brought against Hezekiah and the small remnant in the city of Jerusalem, denying God's faithfulness. You know what? You've trusted on this. It's going to let you down one of these days. Your faith is going to let you down one of these days. One of these days you're going to find out the Bible isn't true. One of these days you're going to find that God doesn't deliver you. And that old preacher Hezekiah, oh yeah, I know he's only a young guy, but that, that, that preacher Hezekiah, he's deceived you. I want you to know he's deceived you. You've got a false hope. You just listen to me, Rab Shekha. I'm telling you, we've got a big movement. It's worldwide. It's worldwide. And if you listen to me, you're going to find out that we will become everything that you need. Trust us. Trust us. The second thing here is a denial of God's love. Not just a denial of God's faithfulness, but a denial of God's love. We find that in verse 25. And I now come up without the Lord. Sorry, let me say it again. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. The Lord said to me, notice he's going to deny God's love to you. He says, do you think I just come up and this was my idea to do this in the nations? Do you think we're just doing all of this thing medically and politically and changing everything? Don't you know God told us to do this? Don't you know that we're serving the real God, the true God. Don't you know that we were commanded to do this? The Lord said to me, go up against the land and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. God told me to do this. You know, you bunch, you're radical. Your loyalty is, is to that old brazen altar. But you know what? God told me to bring my army against you. This was an attack on them having confidence in God. 
that God will allow this to happen in their life. Have you ever met anyone in the church, bad things happen to go, why would God allow that? Why would God allow that? You're being brainwashed. You need to be very careful who you listen to. Why would God let that happen to you? Look at that person. They followed God. Look at them. Are you telling me that God loves them? If God loves us, why would he let that happen? If God loves you, why is this happening? Why is it that you could lose your job or you'd lose a friend or someone doesn't want to have a coffee with you because you're not falling in line with everything? Does God really love you? You're becoming separated and segregated. He goes further here and said, Then said Elohim, the son of Helkiah and Shebna and Joa, unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language. You know what he was speaking? In the Hebrew language. You see, this is different than the first attack on God's faithfulness. He's attacking the leaders. He's attacking the representatives. He's attacking the preachers. And this second one about the love of God, he's speaking in the language of the people so everyone can hear him. Do you know what the leader said? Speak to us in the Syrian language. We understand it. We know what you're saying. But listen to his response here, what he says. He says, Back on to him. I want to speak to those men on the wall. Why would I speak? I want the people to hear me. You know why? I've got a message that I'm trying to get to the people in this hour. And it says in verse 28 that he stood up and cried with a loud voice in the Jews language and speaks saying, hear the word of the Lord, the great king and the king of Assyria. You know this, the devil wants you to hear a message very, very clearly. He's going to challenge and deny the love of God. He's bringing confusion in. Is God really on your side? Are you saying everyone else is wrong and that you're right and that you know God and that God loves you in a special way? Doesn't he love all of us the same? Don't we represent God as well? Then why are you doing what you're doing? You see, you know a man by his fruit, by his message. When, the, when that second beast, the false prophet, appears, remember what I said, he comes looking like a lamb. He has two horns like a lamb. The false prophet that's going to be the greatest deceiver of any generation will look like a lamb. He'll come offering peace and blessing and prosperity and unity. But do you know what? When he opens his mouth, he speaks like a dragon. There's something evil let loose on our world at this time. You know why? They're coming after your liberty. They're coming after your peace. They're coming after the basics and fundamentals of life. Now in Australia and even in France, you can't go in a shop unless you've got your vaccine. They're tightening up in every area and saying, unless you conform, you will not eat. You will not have food on your table. Are you telling me they've got love? Are you telling me these people who are saying we are wrong, that they represent a real God or any form of Christianity or any sort of care? We so care about you, we'll deny you the basics of life. We'll deny you liberties. We'll deny you the normal things of life. Since we're living in an hour of brainwashing, and it's not about what's happening in this hour. It's where it's going to go to. This thing is going to take on a religious supernatural element. How, do you know how I know that? Because the UN, right back at its beginning, there was a spiritual ideology. You know, one of the main people that formed the ideology of the UN was a lady called Alice Bailey. She was a top occultist. And her books, I think about 29 books, she co-authored them with a spirit guide from the Tibetan hills. That's what she said. Do you know she was looking for the annihilation of biblical Christianity and the teaching of blood atonement? Her books, her influence affected all the top people from the beginning of the UN. Her ideology molded the religious ethics and thinking of the United Nations that's now spreading everywhere in our world. I'm telling you, there's something that is happening in our world. 
You know what? You need your brain washed, saints of God. You need the word of God inscribed on your mind. You need to know what you believe in this hour and you need confidence in it. You know why? You're going to get confused if not. The devil comes in, but sure, God sent me. Really? I don't like those horns and I don't like that tail and I certainly don't like your message. I want to tell you. He goes further here, speaking in a loud voice. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you. He attacks Hezekiah. He says the message Hezekiah's preached to you is false and he's deceiving you. Oh, it's not us. It's not the Assyrian army. It's Hezekiah, your own king, inside your own walls, who has lived in the midst of you. He's deceiving you. Do not let him deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do you see how he attacks the preaching of the word of God? Those that proclaim the word of God. This great general begins to attack and say, he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's trying to make you trust in the Lord in the promises of God, but nothing's going to come of it. Don't you realize everything is back to, fo- uh, back to front? Black is white and black, uh, black is white and white is black. He's playing games. You know what this is? This is brainwashing. This is brainwashing. When you present yourself as representing the love of God, he denies God's love and saying, why is God letting this happen to you? Don't you know God has sent me against you? You're on the deceived side. I'm in freedom. Why don't you come over here? I believe as the days pass by, greater and greater deception is going to come in on this. Notice what he says about the consequence from verse 30. Neither Hezekiah, don't let him make you trust. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present. Do you know what he's saying? You can compromise. You can compromise. Don't you realize this is the love of God? The real love of God is to compromise. How do you recognize the character of God's love? It's very broad. And you know what? I want to give you gifts. Let's make an agreement together. Let's join together. Why don't you bring gifts and give it unto the king of Assyria and we'll call it quits and you can enjoy everything together. He said, if you make an agreement with the king of Assyria and come out to me now, then you will eat your own vine and your own fig tree and drink at your own waters until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. Oh, I know it's not like your land, but I'm going to take you to land. It'll look like your land. It'll feel like your land, but it won't be your land. Do you know what he's offering? Is a compromised form of Christianity in this hour. Do you realize many are about to make a decision to fall in line with political, religious, social ideologies. They will compromise personal convictions. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to go in a different direction. They don't want to go against the flow. Do you know what they're going to start doing? Is compromising. You can have a Christianity. You know what? You can be a part of this. You won't be out of step with any. Personal convictions won't get in the way. And we'll present you a Christianity that looks like the real, It looks like what you have like your land. It's not your land, but it looks like your land. And you can make yourself think it's your land. You can have a form of Christianity that looks like Christianity. Oh, it's not the old Christianity. It's a new form of Christianity. And you can make yourself deceived to think it's just the same. And you just fit in. It's a broad religious system in this hour. He says, do not let Hezekiah persuade you. Do you see who they attack? They attack those with the word of God that have a clear message. God's going to deliver us. Can I tell you something, church, now? The church of Jesus Christ, they can get the politics. They can get the medical system. Listen to me very carefully. In this hour, they can take over all the institutions, the IMF, the UN, all these institutions, business, the local shops, 
There's only one institution they can't have. And can I tell you, it's a small remnant called the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? All those preachers who say the Lord's going to deliver this church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The real remnant of God are going to be preserved. God will answer their prayers and bring them through this hour of darkness. Don't be persuaded by Hezekiah. Can I tell you, we need a generation of preachers like Hezekiah to rise up and say, stand your ground, stand your ground, don't move, keep trust in the word of God, keep your faith in the Lord, don't change, don't compromise, don't leave these walls, don't listen to them. But third and finally, he denies God's power, he denies God's faithfulness, he denies God's love, now he's denying God's power. Has any of the gods, verse 33, has any of the gods of the nations delivered at all from his hand, the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Orphad? Where are the gods of Seraphim and Henai and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria, which is the northern region of ten tribes, which were carried away a short time before? Was Samaria saved? What about the denominations, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Anglicans and the Catholic Church? Although the Catholic Church is putting up more of a fight than the other Protestants. I want to tell you that. I'm shocked by the Catholic. There's more Catholic priests are standing up and saying, this is wrong. Where's all the preachers? Where's all the preachers in this hour? Do you know what Rab Sheka is saying here? He's saying, look at all these other institutions and cities. Don't you know we've taken over the medical system? Don't you know the Anglicans? Uh, what's his name? Weebly, Wobbly, whatever his name is. The head of the Church of England. I know I've got that wrong deliberately. Weebly, Wobbly. You know these men, they're utter apostates. They don't know this Christ. And you've got a whole denomination will say, we're falling in line with the World Economic Forum. I'm sure you are. What are. Look at who's following us. Look at who is with us. He denies the power of God. Don't you know your Irish government couldn't stand against us? And the doctors couldn't. And the scientists couldn't. We could buy them. We bought your scientists and your doctors. And if they didn't write what we want them to write, they weren't going to get a job. And we start affecting this. They've all come on board. It was Mr. Kennedy Sr. who said, every man at his price. I can buy any man in this world. That's what he believed. Many men have believed that every man has his price. Can I tell you, not a real born again Christian. I don't have a price. No man can threaten me. No man can buy me. No man can intimidate me. A real Christian whose conscience is bound by the word of God, is a free man. He goes further here in verse 35. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand? You see, Assyria had spread globally in that hour. Nations had been taken over. Kings, gods had fallen. No religion could stand against it. All of the religions were coming in behind us. Islam. Buddhism, Hinduism, New Ageism, even the Church of Satan is joining in on this thing. What's wrong with you? Are you saying that all of these have joined? They're all conforming. Why are you not doing it? I want to tell you, because I know there's power with God. You see, he comes and he denies the power. We can defeat everyone. We can defeat anyone. We've defeated strong institutions and nations and leaders and gods and religions. We can get Islam and Catholicism to meet together and to worship together. What's wrong with you bunch? I'm a free man. I haven't been brainwashed. Can I tell you? I'm not ecumenical because I haven't been brainwashed. I'm not compromising with apostasy because I haven't been brainwashed. I haven't slowly yielded all my convictions. I, I've been washed by the word of God. It's renewed my mind. I've got a renewed mind that believes what this book says. I'm an old fashioned Christian. The same that were in Jerusalem 2000 years ago. I, I'm a part of that great movement that spread across this world. Every nation spread to the furthest boundaries of China more than 1500 years ago. I'm going to tell you this gospel is a mighty thing. He says, but the people held their peace. 
How are you going to respond when the enemy comes and says, who are you, you're a small people in the corner of the world? Do you know, if you go back in the history books to 200 years after Patrick and the church that was in Ireland, it was on fire. All of Ireland had broken out in the gospel. There was a revival in Ireland. Paganism was broken in the entire nation. Missionaries were being raised up and sent out all across Europe. You know what the Pope in Rome said? There's letters written by the Pope to the church in Ireland. And he said, who do you think you are? You're a small people in the end of the earth. And here you are, you don't submit to my authority. You don't listen to me. You won't do like we're telling you to do. Who do you think you are? You know what? Those Irish missionaries rose up and said, we're Bible-believing Christians. We are bound by the Word of God. We've been washed by the Word of God. We don't listen to commands from the Vatican in the city of Rome. Do you know what? Our headquarters is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we listen to Him. We read the Bible. We read the Word of God. Saints, I'm telling you about an hour in Hezekiah's life where this political, religious overwhelming system was at the very gates saying you're going to be defeated and that spirit that power and it was demonic it was denying the faithfulness of God God will won't be faithful to you God does not love you there's no power with you don't believe what the Bible says don't believe what the preachers are telling you you know what you will be defeated in this hour but there was a people that stood their ground that stood up that made their last stand. And we're told in the next chapter what they done. Do you know what they done? They went to prayer. They went to seek in God's face. And as they began to pray and seek God's face and rent their garments, symbolizing their hearts, you know what happened? That old preacher called Isaiah the prophet stood up, come to them, and began to prophesy. Do you know what he prophesied? First thing he prophesied, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Have you seen what's outside? Do you see what's happening in the nations? Do you know what could happen to us? Be not afraid. Do you hear me tonight? I'm talking about having your minds renewed by the word of God. But look at what's happening. Be not afraid. That was the first thing. He goes on to say, don't you know God listens to all that's happening in this hour? Don't you know God is going to judge every heart for what is happening in this hour? Don't you know it's a reproach against God? He actually prophesies in chapter 19, verse 7. And I, God, will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rabshakeh returned. Isaiah gives a prophecy about what is going to happen. Do you know the Lord sent one angel? And you can check this in your history books. If you go on to Google or Wikipedia or some of these sites that have archaeological evidence and you read the history of Rabshakeh with his army at the gates of Jerusalem at this very time, and you go into the ancient, secular, Assyrian history books, do you know what they say? They say, suddenly something happened, and we had to turn and leave and return home. Do you know what's written in this? God sent one angel in the night and slew 185,000 soldiers in Assyria's army. And the next day they got up and they left. Isaiah begins to prophesy and he says, not one arrow is going to come over this wall. And he says, you know what? You the remnant, your roots are going to go down into the ground and your branches are going to spring forth and you're going to start bearing fruit. But look at all the enemies. Look what's happening. I'm telling you, the church is going to prosper in this hour and the church is going to stand in this hour and the church is going to evangelize in this hour and the church is going to experience revival in this hour. Hezekiah has seen the greatest revival do you know that Hezekiah's revival, there's more written in the Bible about Hezekiah's revival than any other biblical revival in Israel or church history for all through those thousands of years. Nothing more was written than about Hezekiah's revival and details are given 
about a people who stood in their hour and God sent revival. Church, I want to tell you, we are living in an hour of brainwashing. Your nation of Ireland is being brainwashed. Your political system, your medical system, your media system, and we're only one of some 200 nations. Something is happening in this hour. And I assure you, there's going to be a clash and there is going to be a rebellion amongst genuine believers across this world. Because you know what? This isn't an opinion or an ideology or a preference over something. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus, of the one who died 2,000 years ago on a cross for you and I. And you know what? It's non-negotiable. I'm a non-conformist. I'm a Christian who's had his mind renewed. The word of God is written on my mind. And you know what? There's no room for compromise or deception in this. Would you stand with me as we close here? Praise you, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, here tonight. Father, I pray for us that we would have minds that are renewed by the word of God. We realize that we are in a spiritual battle in this hour, Lord God, through media, Lord God, through the internet, through our own society, what's happening politically and medically, what is happening, oh God, in the education system that has so taught evolution that it's now bringing an entire generation to transhumanism, to be enjoined to a computer and to create a, the next stage of evolution that will bring us into Bible prophecy. My God, we are asking that you revive your church again, that you set us on fire, that you raise up men like Hezekiah that cleave to the Lord, that trust in the Lord alone, that lean on him, that believe in his word and obey his commandments. My God, it's an hour for us to clean up the church to remove every tradition, all idolatry, all compromise, and to come back to the word of God again. We praise you and bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Oh, we bless you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you. Would you have your way in this hour? Would you have your way? Lord God, Lord God, we bless you, Lord Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Saints, there is a war going on, and it's for your minds. Do not think that you will stand unless you wash your mind with the Word of God. Thoughts are going to come against you that you never imagine. Remember like I told you when I was sweeping the church floor, and that overwhelming experience, spirit, whatever you'd want to call it, it come over me. I have never had anything before that or since that, but that shows me that was a spirit that brought thoughts to my mind that I'd never had in my entire life before. It was spiritual. It was spiritual. And you know what you need to realize? <coughs> In this hour soon, if you don't know how to discern, how to test, don't go by feelings or emotions. You'll be deceived. In the church, by a preacher, by a false prophet, by a political system, you've got to go by facts. That's how you get around deception. You test everything by the word of God. You scrutinize it. You look at it. Don't just go with your emotions or feelings. <coughs> and there is coming a spirit of deception, the like of which you cannot imagine. But there is going to be a people who stand. And it's the body of Christ a church with the Bible, the Word of God in their hands. God bless you. <clears throat>